Hi class and welcome back. Today's album recommendation is the album The High Women by The High Women, which is a country music supergroup comprising Brandi Carlisle, Natalie Hemby, Maren Morris, and Amanda Shires. Uh, they all have amazing voices, they're amazing musicians, uh, and they wrote some amazing songs together. I don't even listen to that much country music and this album is just top-notch fantastic. So it's highly recommended, it's very catchy, uh, and it's all the sort of music that you'd want to sing along to in the car. So today we're talking about surface intervals. And so in order to review a bit, let's talk about some other integrals. So I wrote a question here, which is, what does each of these integrals measure? So the first integral, the integral over f, over c of f dot dp, we said this is the flow or um, circulation of f along c. And so we have in the back of our brains that c is some sort of uh, closed curve starting and stopping at the same point uh, and flowing uh, f is you know some sort of vector field that we can understand. I've drawn c in two dimensions, but this could be in three dimensions or n dimensions. We do doesn't really matter. The formula is the same either way. Uh, just f and p e a parameterization and the vector field might be in multiple dimensions. The next integral we talked about last time, this is a flux integral. So it measures uh, flow across rather than flow along uh, C. And so it tells you how much of F is going along C. So whereas the first one might be telling you, uh, you know, you might have, for example, um, F could be like wind currents. And then this tells you how much the wind, uh, this integral tells you how much the wind agrees with your path or how much you're fighting it. So if this is positive, this would tell you that uh, you're flying or moving, like let's say this is an airplane path, this is flying uh, with the wind rather than against it or perpendicular to it. Um, on the other hand, for flux integrals, you might have, for instance, that f is like a uh, water flow uh, in a pool or something. And then uh, if you take this path C, it could be telling you how much water is crossing the path. So oh, the integral over C of f dot dn will tell you how much water uh, is flowing across C. So in particular, if like F goes around, if C goes around some drain, uh, so if there's like uh, a drain hole in your pool uh, and all the water is slowly going into that drain hole or there's a leak maybe in the tank, uh, this will tell you how much water is flowing across C to go in that hole, uh, for instance. So uh, the next one I wrote here, integral of P dx plus Q dy over C. This is just some line integral in uh, two dimensions. And so it might be either a flow or a flux integral uh, depending on how you interpret your um, vector field. So it could be a flow or flux integral. 
uh, depending. And we talked about this last time, that kind of the, the two different ways, if you turn it into a flow integral, you get the curl form of uh, Green's theorem that you can maybe apply to this if C is a closed curve. Uh, and if you turn it into a flux integral, you can apply the divergence form. Uh, and so I'm going to just mention these over here. This might be the curl form of Green's theorem. And the flux integral could give you the divergence form of Green's theorem. And this kind of summarizes what we talked about essentially all of last week uh, insofar as uh, understanding Green's theorem, planimeters, flow and flux integrals, uh, and line integrals. But there are other types of integrals we've talked about, and uh, the example I want to focus on today is this one, the double integral over R of dS. And so this is a surface area integral, and so it would compute the surface area of, for instance, z equals f of x, y, some graph, over the region R. And so we might have some sort of uh, picture that we've got here is z, here's x, here's y. Um, maybe we've got this region R down here in the plane. And we've got somehow lying above it. Oh, let's go here. Maybe this is my surface z equals f of x comma y. And so up above that uh, region, there's some like distorted version of, uh, you know, the surface area that we're trying to compute. And so the area of this uh, blue region up here, which you could think of as, um, this is like F of R upstairs. Um, and it's living, you know, directly over this region R, but it's been distorted because it lives on this surface. Um, the surface area of that will be computed with this integral, provided that dS we write as the square root of 1 plus um, d f dx squared plus d y d f d y squared d x d y. Um, and this was our kind of like favorite formula. Uh, and sometimes we wrote d x d y as just dA, because maybe the region R is better off in polar notation or something like that. So today we're going to um, try to redo this uh, surface area integral for a more general case. So uh, let's recall kind of how we came up with this form, and then we'll improve it. So when we computed the surface area form, ds, the way we did it was we took a little square downstairs of area. And so I'm imagining that this is like within my region R that I'm integrating over. And this is the tiny contributing piece of area downstairs. And I want to know upstairs how much it has been deformed by the graph. And so we came up with these vectors. Um, u and v. And so in the x direction, you imagine like I have to take a, just a tiny step dx upstairs. I've moved dx, but my u, my uh, z coordinate has increased because there was some derivative in the x direction. And that's recorded over here by because u's coordinates are dx in the x component, zero in the y component, because I only took a step in the x direction and the partial derivative in the z direction, because that's how we define partial derivatives. And the same holds true for v. I took a step in the y direction. I So I moved 0 in the x direction, a step in the y direction, and I want to know how much my 
z component changed, it changed by my partial derivative times the distance traveled. And so if I take this tiny step up here, it looks like I'm maybe going down a little uh, in the z direction. And this gives me a formula to compute ds. And it looked something like ds was the um, magnitude of the cross product u cross v times dA. Uh, yeah. But lots of functions don't come to us uh, as a graph. Um, and so this is the weak point of this approach, is we only get a way to compute surface area for graphs. Uh, so only if we can write it as z equals f of x comma y. But there are lots of things that are inconvenient to write as graphs. For instance, uh, things like spheres. So if you want to write um, a sphere, let's write out a better sphere, as a graph, you'd have to like split it in half and only take the upper half and the lower half and compute the surface area separately. Um, but that seems inconvenient because I just don't want to do that. I want to make my <laughs> integral easier. So in order to be able to compute things like surface area for spheres, or as we're going to see other types of integrals over spheres, uh, we're going to try to convert this to a parameterized version of a graph. So let's come up with a new formula and our new assumption will be I have a parameterization of a surface. And so we've seen these already for planes where we had L of S comma T gave us a two-dimensional uh, two-dimensional parameterization because I had two input coordinates and my outputs were whatever my ambient space was. So that tended to be R3. So in general, it's not going to just look like a plane. We're going to have some sort of parameterization P uh, for our surface, P equals, uh, and now we need new coordinates. I'm not going to use S and T, I'm going to use U and V, uh, kind of like U sub. Uh, and that's, I'm using these to line up with the notation I used above, uh, but just now imagine that these are new parameters that we've made up, kind of like our S and T time parameters for planes. So if I have parameterization, what that needs to give me is a vector in R3 uh, that this vector valued thing sweeps out my surface as I vary u and v. So that's going to give me kind of three different functions. Those are like x of u comma v, y of u comma v, and z of u comma v. And as, you know, u is in some domain, um, uh, so like I'll have some, you know, for some parameters, uh, uh, in some domain in the uh, uv plane, p uh, parameterizes um, our surface, and we'll call our surface S for surface, uh, and this will be the way we do our parameterization. So uh, the way we're going to use this to get a formula is, and let me give myself a little bit more room, uh, is we write down our uh, partial derivatives for p in terms of u and v. 
So uh, on one hand, we've got dp du, and that looks like dx du, dy du, dv du. And uh, we look at our partial derivative dp dv. So that's dx uh, dv, dy dv, d, uh, oh, I wrote v here, but I meant z, dz dv. Uh, and let's also compare this to an example. So the running example will be uh, for right now is what if L of S, L of, let's say, again, UV, but I'm using ST for our plane, is a plane, so maybe it's a plane, um, uh, I've got two vectors, let's call those vectors A and B, so A times U plus B times V, uh, and then I'm going to assume I'm just translating by the zero vector, just to simplify things, then our picture should be for what L looks like is I've got this uh, plane, it goes through the origin, and if I draw A that way and B this way, different counts of U and V kind of uh, grid out the plane based on those two vectors. In this case, uh, D P D L D U is just the vector A. So it's just telling me the slope in the U direction. As I vary U, how much am I increasing a point by? I'm increasing it by precisely A. Okay? And D L D V is gonna be B. Um, and so I'm just really reading these off of this coordinates, uh, but yeah, should be kind of straightforward. So this is why I just have the, these two different derivative directions, because I'm assuming that my surface um, can be parameterized by u and v. Uh, but I'm going to note up here in plane, you could also imagine that you have some, uh, or the, in the sphere, you could imagine you've got some sort of parameterization for the sphere where like that direction is u and this direction here is v. Uh, and I'll give you a parameterization for the sphere on the next slide uh, and we'll move forward with kind of understanding this. But with these uh, formalisms, we're gonna define ds as follows. So I got a little bit of space left. Our new form for ds and I'm putting this big because I'm going to put it in a box, is just take the magnitude of the cross product, dp du cross dp dv times du dv, and that's really like my area form. Uh, and so in the case of a plane, for instance, this area would be computing the area of this parallelogram. Uh, and so if you take the area above just like a small square in the plane, upstairs it will look like uh, one of these little parallelograms and have some skewed area because the plane has been held at a tilt. Uh, and this agrees with kind of our understanding of cross product. So let's use this formula now. Uh, I'm gonna put a big box around it. This is gonna be great. Uh, and this tells us how to compute now the surface area of any surface. I may be using S in two different ways. I don't know. So this will tell us now that I can get the surface area of S as the double integral over um, s of this ds form. Uh, and in order to make sense of this, you have to turn, you have to tell me what is my domain uh, r in the uv plane, such that this looks like r of uh, integral dp 
du cross dp dv du dv and now I've passed to the u and v parameterized coordinates. So in the same way that we did a lot of line integrals by passing to time coordinates, we are going to do these types of surface integrals by passing to the parameterized coordinates for the surface. And this right here is our first example of a really honest-to-goodness surface integral. Uh, and we'll see another couple examples by the end of class. But you should realize that already every surface area integral we've done was a surface integral. And now we're just expanding our power with surface integrals. So let's compute the surface area of the unit sphere. I'm going to do this without passing to graphs or taking square roots. I'm going to do this by parameterizing it. So my parameters are going to be spherical coordinates. So in spherical coordinates, the unit sphere is the sphere rho equals 1. And so then I can parameterize it in spherical coordinates by just taking um, my other two variables, theta and phi. And if I vary theta between 0 and 2 pi and phi between 0 and pi, I get the whole sphere. And we've already written down our parameterization using uh, our standard spherical coordinate translations. So in spherical coordinates, x, we said, was r cosine theta, which then r was um, rho sine phi cos theta. And y was r sine theta, which became rho sine phi sine theta. And z was just rho uh, cos, uh, cos phi. Now, I'm assuming rho is 1 in my sphere, so my parameterization, uh, p of, and I'm going to use th theta and phi as my parameters, so I'm using theta as u and phi as v, uh, because it's easier to think about them as theta and phi than as u and v, is going to look like my x component is sine phi cos theta. My y component is sine phi sine theta. And my z component is just cos phi. So using our previous formula, I need to compute I want to compute the surface area integral. And in order to do that, I'll take the derivative of p with respect to theta and with respect to phi. So dp d theta is uh, derivative of cosine theta is negative sine theta. And the sine phi stays along as a constant. Uh, over here, I get sine phi cos theta. And the last coordinate has no theta, so I get 0. And dp uh, d phi is uh, cos phi cos theta uh, minus, oh, sorry, cos phi sine theta. And then cosine phi gives me minus sine phi. So I need to compute, so in order to compute this double integral over my region R, uh, and just to be clear, the region R, uh, let's go like this, uh, region R of ds, the region R is uh, theta goes from 0 to 2 pi, phi goes from 0 to pi, uh, and ds is now dp d theta cross d p d phi magnitude d theta d phi 
I just need to compute this cross product, so let's compute that. Uh, the cross product of these two vectors is going to be, uh, let's go i, j, k, uh, minus sine theta, sine phi, sine theta, cos, oh, sorry, sine phi, cos theta, zero, cos phi, cos theta, cos phi, sine theta, minus sine phi. Uh, and I'm just going to do this quickly. So I got this quickly by computing my cross product. Um, and I already see that there's a few things I can maybe simplify. So I've got a uh, sine phi cos phi in both of these, and then a sine squared and cosines plus sine squ cosine squared, and that's a 1. So uh, even just this bottom one I can factor. Um, so like all of this becomes sine squared plus cosine squared is 1 times negative 1 times uh, sine phi cos phi. So this is just minus sine phi cos phi. And now I'm going to compute the magnitude of this vector. Uh, I didn't denote that, but I should be computing magnitude of this determinant, uh, or of this cross product. And what's the magnitude of that? Well, it's this square root. And then, again, I have a cosine squared plus sine squared times the same factor. So I can uh, factor those out and just get sine to the fourth uh, phi. And so when I cancel this, I think I'm going to get something that looks like square root of sine squared phi times sine squared phi plus cosine squared phi. And so this also gives me a 1, and this just is sine squared phi. Phi is always between 0 and 1, or sorry, uh, 0 and pi, which is where sine is positive. So the square root of sine squared is, in fact, just sine of phi. It's always positive. So my ultimate integral up here is this double integral. So 0, theta goes from 0 to 2 pi phi goes from 0 to pi of sine phi d theta d phi. Since sine integrates to be uh, uh, m minus cosine, my final answer is that my surface area of the sphere is, well, the theta integrates to be 2 pi the, uh, d theta integrates to be a theta, so I get 2 pi minus 0 times, and then sine integrates to be minus cosine, and minus cosine evaluated from 0 to pi is minus cosine of pi minus minus cosine of 0. Uh, oh, I don't love how I've written this. Um, I'm gonna just, there we go, put that in a box. Uh, Cosine of pi is minus 1, and cosine of 0 is 1, so this is uh, 1 minus minus 1, so that's 2, which is 4 pi. Uh, and in fact, in general, the surface area of a sphere of radius, radius r uh, is 4 pi r squared. Uh, so, looks like we got the right answer, and you can also see that even if I added, it turns out if you add in rho to this uh, and let rho be some constant r, you can also recover this 4 pi r squared formula equally easily. It's really not that bad. And this should show you the power of doing these surface area parameterizations. So just to recap, we took the sphere, and we used spherical coordinates to give one parameterization that covered all of the sphere. So we have, and in this parameterization, you've got like the sphere, and it's really a parameterization by lines of longitude and latitude. So, uh, you know, uh, phi is latitude, and theta is longitude. 
um, from the positive z-axis being up. Uh, and this is how you compute the surface area of a sphere uh, using parameterizations. So if we actually have a graph, then we can recover our old formula. Just set your parameterization, p of u comma v, to be, uh, just make u x v y, and then the z coordinate is f of u comma v. And so this is really just replacing x with u and y with v. Uh, and then you'll discover that ds is exactly the formula we wrote down before. So dp du cross dp dv. Well, uh, when you compute dp du and dp dv, you're going to get zeros um, in the opposite spot. So like dp du... Uh, this guy will vanish and go to zero, for instance. Uh, and for dpdv, this guy vanishes and goes to zero because there's no u's and no v's, respectively. Um, and so this ends up exactly equaling um, the square root of 1 plus uh, fx squared plus fy squared. Uh, DA, respectively. So, uh, you know, this, this is always going to give you um, the same formula. So in other words, we've just learned something strictly better than what we knew before. Okay, but surface area is not the most complicated thing to try to compute. What we're going to be interested in is flow of vector fields. And so in three dimensions, a vector field can flow across a surface. So let's first consider the vector field 0, 0, x, and then we'll consider a bunch of different surfaces and in these four examples and uh, try to look at the fluxes across them. So for the example one, uh, I'm going to let the full surface be, I uh, don't like how I drew that be this plane, or this little rectangle, in the x, z plane, and try to understand uh, the flow across it. Now, in order to make sense of this, I actually need to give an orientation to the flow. So I'm going to try, try to explain this, but I'm going to orient my surface so that is my normal direction. To the, to the rectangle. So imagine this is like you trying to decide, am I living uh, on this side of the plane or do I live you know, on the bottom side of the plane? And I'm telling you that this person who lives standing on the plane is determining the correct upward direction. So we're going to say that the flow through the surface is positive if the vector field is also going, is agreeing with the upward direction. So the flow will be positive if it's coming from underneath the surface to above the surface. So it's going from the bottom to the top. Uh, and let's just write that down. So flow positive if flowing up relative to the surface's orientation. So uh, given this orientation, I might look at my uh, vector field f. So let's do f in green. Um, f has only uh, z components of my vector field, and it, that z component gets bigger as we get farther along the x-axis. So uh, when you're at a point over here that's really low on the x-axis, you might have a really tiny arrow pointing up. But then when you're out here, where this person is, you're going to end up with a much larger arrow pointing up. But either way, if you, you know, end up pick one of these ones somewhere in the middle, uh, the vector field is actually perpendicular to the normal direction for this plane. So 
the flow is kind of going along the surface rather than through it, right? So if you're the sky, the flow is moving to the left. It's like he's doing the electric slide rather than uh, pushing him off of the surface. So the flow here is zero. Or uh, put another way, the flux is uh, zero here. Okay, so let's swap surfaces. Same vector field, but my new surface in example two is going to be, uh, let's take this surface here and uh, let's orient it that way. So the z-axis, positive z-axis is up. Well, now my life is totally different, right? So as I move uh, farther in the x-axis, these this vector field is pointing more and more positive in the z direction. And so as you like move around, if you pick this point on the plane, oh, it's going to be shorter. It's going to be something like this. If you're actually at the y-axis, it's zero because x is zero there. But then as you move over, it's getting you know more and more upwards flow uh, all around the surface. And so here, f is parallel to n, and they're pointing in the same direction. So in fact, f dot n is bigger than zero, and therefore we are going to expect the flow, the flux, to be positive. Because if you're standing on this surface and this flow, this f is like, you know, wind or water current or some sort of flow and you're trying to stay on the surface, you need to like be tied to it, not to be pushed off by the green arrows. Um, okay, so let's, uh, let's pick another example. Uh, let's do this one over here. Uh, so let's take a rectangle in the uh, zy plane and let's orient it so that uh, the positive x direction is perpendicular. Then um, again, so if you pick any point in the plane, all of these points have uh, x equal to 0. And so my vector field f is just equal to 0 on uh, the plane. And so in particular, inside of this green rectangle, f is always 0 which means there is zero flow for a trivial reason, just there is no force there. Uh, so no force, so f, uh, so my flux is zero. Uh, so for maybe a last example, let's, uh, let's pick another, um, another rectangle, but I'm gonna pick one up here. Uh, that looks good. Trim this. Um, okay, and uh, so here's my rectangle. Uh, I'm going to shade it in this time. And I'm going to orient this rectangle by that way is down or is up. So down is up. Uh, and down is up is a bad sentence. I'm going to say down is positive. Orientation. So uh, in, I don't know if people read like the Dr. Seuss's Butter Paddle book as children, um, but uh, in this is like the butter side down people winning the fight and down is uh, positive. So in this case, the vector field uh, over here on this part of the rectangle, that's at x equals zero, so the vector field is zero. That's why I'm trying to draw dots. If you're here, it's kind of short going up. And then as you move over, it becomes much longer going up. Uh, but you'll notice that uh, f is parallel to n, but the dot product now is negative because they're pointing in opposite directions. Uh, and so here, the flux will be negative. Hopefully that gives you an eyeball for what I mean by flux through a surface. 
now we're just going to define it as an integral, and then we will be able to work out what the flux is for more complicated surfaces where we need to provide parameterizations, and we can't just eyeball it. So we're going to define a flux integral, which is a type of surface integral. We're going to have a requirement, which is, uh, let's say, we have a parameterization P uh, parameterizing per Uh, surface, the surface, uh, and it parameterizes it with uh, domain R. And so rather than doing things over the surface, I'm just going to use this domain R to express all my integrals. Uh, and I have a requirement that the surface must be oriented. So you have to have picked uh, which way is positive normal? So pick a positive normal direction. Uh, then, well, our flux integral uh, through the surface will be the double integral over R of whatever my vector field F is dot uh, N hat ds. So I'm taking my normal direction and I'm making it be unit length so it is not contributing anything to this dot product in magnitude. And now when I take the dot product, it just tells me how much does f agree with the positive direction or agree with the negative direction. So uh, oftentimes this is not a, it's, it's kind of inconvenient to compute uh, what n hat is. But fortunately, uh, there's kind of a better formula for n hat ds. And so it turns out that all of this n hat ds can be re-expressed as f dot dp du cross dp dv du dv. So before we had an, in order to get ds, we took an absolute value of this. Um, but now I'm telling you actually that vector is n hat. It's pointing in the direction n hat. And so uh, we want to imagine that if we've got this uh, surface and we're at a point on it, let's say maybe this is the u direction uh, and this over here is the v direction, then in fact u cross v uh, is going to point up that way. So since these are the directions, I should call them like dv and du, point in those directions, then this cross product dp cross uh, dp du cross um, cross dp dv is uh, orthogonal to the surface, so it's normal to the surface, uh, and points uh, off. So if you've picked your orientation, which means picking a choice of orders, so you picked u first, then v, so that the cross product points out. Um, and so an orientation is the same as picking an order for um, u and v, uh, so that uh, the cross product Uh, points uh, in the positive normal direction that you've chosen. And so, for example, in the sphere that we parameterized before, uh, imagine you're at a point here, right, where you're on some line of longitude and some line of latitude. So here's your theta direction, and here's your, uh, oh, sorry, well, 
put it this way. Uh, you're on some line of longitude and some line of latitude. So as you change theta, you're going to be moving around to a different line of longitude uh, because you're changing your x, y coordinates in the plane. You're spinning the sphere. And as you change uh, phi, you're moving farther down the sphere. So in fact, if you want on the sphere the uh, outward normal orientation is instead of uv, what you should really pick is phi comma theta. Uh, and so you should notice this is actually agrees with our like standard orientation for um, spherical coordinates. So if I've like, I've kind of like forgotten about the row, but then phi theta agrees with my d rho d phi d theta um, volume form order. So uh, believe it or not, we've actually been using this orientation, the outward normal one, kind of all along in spherical coordinates. We just didn't specify why we were doing it. Um, but you should check now that the if you take the cross product green then blue, you're pointing out of the sphere rather than into it. But if you do theta then blue then green, theta then phi, you're pointing into the sphere. So this is why you want to pick this orientation. Um, and so the key place where that matters is if you want to compute this, you would use uh, d, p, d, phi cross d, p, d, theta. And earlier where we, you know, for this term here, earlier when we were computing surface area, we took a magnitude of this cross product. So the order we picked it did not matter. But if you're computing a flux integral, the order does matter in order to get the right sign on your flux. If you do it backwards, you can always just add a negative though, uh, because cross product is anti-symmetric. So switching the orders adds a negative sign. So let's now look at some examples. So let's first check, in fact, that this, these two forms are equal to each other. Um, if you write down what ds is, you'll be able to get this right now if you pause the video. Uh, but the way I would think about this is I'm going to define this cross product to be n uh, just the vector n. And so n depends on u and v. Um, but n I've chosen so that n hat, this is equal to n divided by the magnitude of n. So if I make n into a unit vector. But then the only remaining thing to notice is that ds we defined as being the magnitude of n dA, or uh, let's write that as du dv for dA. And so the left-hand side looks like n hat. Uh, n hat ds is n divided by n's magnitude times uh, n's magnitude du dv. And the right-hand side looks like n du dv. And so really the only thing that's happening is I'm canceling those two magnitudes by each other to arrive at this formula on the right. The formula on the right is really useful and it's how we're gonna pass two parameterizations. So this formula will be as useful as the, um, the formula where we said uh, the integral, whoop, over c of f dot dp was the integral for whatever time parameters we had of f of p of t dot p prime of t dt. So uh, if you see surface area integrals, you should think about this uh, right-hand form for the surface integral as being the pass to parameters form for it. I see I missed an R there, but yeah, looks good. 
Example three, compute the flux of two j hat plus three k hat through a square of side length j perpendicular to the y-axis oriented in the minus j direction. So your picture for this should be, I've got uh, x, y, z. Where is my square? Uh, the square, it, the, I didn't specify exactly where it was, but it's perpendicular to the y-axis. So I'm just going to draw it uh, kind of like this. Okay, so I'm imagining the y-axis kind of runs through it, so maybe I... Uh, something like that. It's perpendicular to the y-axis. And uh, this square is oriented in the minus j direction, so the orientation for the square... is in that direction, minus j. Uh, so I can take n hat for this to be a unit vector pointing in the minus j direction, so just minus j uh, is the way I read this. Uh, so let's label this uh, s for square. Let's just call this r for region. Uh, and so by definition, the flux is going to be the double integral over r of f, so that's um, 0, 2, 3. Uh, you know what? I never write things with i's and j's, so why don't I do that? So the double integral over r of 2j hat plus 3k hat dot, uh, so here's my f, f dot n hat. Uh, let's do this in a different color, because I'm trying to show what I'm filling in. So I've got f dot n hat ds, right? And f is that vector field, n hat is minus j hat, and ds is just ds. So I can compute this dot product using um, my dot products for i, j, and k. So uh, cross products are the ones that do i times i cross j equals k, etc. But dot products, they're all a zero unless you dot them with themselves. So j dot j is one and k dot j is zero. So you get that this whole integral is equal to um, minus two ds over r, which means that this is, uh, so my flux is equal to um, minus 2 times the double integral of ds over r. That's just the surface area. And this is a square of side length 7. So my answer is minus 2 times the area of the square of side length 7. That's 7 times seven, uh, and that's my answer. So I definitely get negative flux, uh, even though it's hard to eyeball that, um, but you could notice that uh, f is moving plus two in the y direction and plus three in the z direction, so f is sort of constant going up in that direction, and it does in fact look like that makes a, an obtuse angle with n, so therefore, I should be getting negative flux, uh, but this is what we get just by computing it. Notice I didn't actually parameterize my square. I didn't need to. I didn't know where it was. I still had enough information to solve the problem. Example four. Let q of uv be uv0 and f be 0, 0, 1. Let the domain of q be the unit disk centered at the origin and compute flux across q. So it so happens that in this example, I can... Uh, exactly figure out what q is parameterizing, because the parameterization is quite simple. u and v are just my x and y coordinates, and z is always zero. So this is parameterizing the x, y plane, uh, and since my domain has been restricted to be the unit disk, this is parameterizing the unit disk in the x, y plane. So if I draw z, x, y, q looks like... Uh, I'm pretty bad at drawing these uh, disks, but here's Q. Uh, it's this unit disk. 
Um, so one, one. So it's the unit disk in that axis, and let's just draw it. Yeah, going up. Um, and then f is zero zero one. So f, if I draw in green, is always pointing straight up. So the only question really is what is the orientation on Q? And because U and V are already because the parameterization is given, you Q comes with a an orientation. And the orientation is U then V. So the U V orientation, which is standard, just like the XY plane, becomes the um positive orientation on xv. So u is pointing in the x direction, v is pointing in the y direction, so u cross v is pointing in the z direction. Uh, so this gives uh, a standard orientation of uh, plus one, uh, positive z on the xy plane. Um, a way to see this is really like what is dq? Because I don't want this to be um, magical science, right? So this is my normal vector is dq du cross dq dv. dq du is just uh, 1 comma 0 comma 0, and dq dv is 0 comma 1 comma 0. And so that's just telling me that n is i hat cross j hat, which is just k hat. So it's a positive z direction. Uh, and f itself is also just k hat. So uh, my final integral looks like I'm computing the integral of k hat dot k hat ds over the unit disk. k hat dot k hat is 1, and then times the surface area of the disk. So my answer is. Uh, pi r squared, r is 1, so just pi. For example 5, let p of u comma v be u comma v comma 1 minus u squared minus v squared. f is the same vector field of last time, 0, 0, 1, and let the domain of p again be the unit disk d. So compute the flux across p. The first thing I would do is notice that this is actually a function. Uh, so I could think of z as being 1 minus x squared minus y squared, uh, which is in fact a downward-facing parabola. So if I draw myself my favorite downward-facing parabola, uh, and let's draw the plane, uh, let's draw uh, at 0, 0, this was this is the point um, uh, zero zero one in the z direction. So my axes look something like this. Here's z. Here's the x-axis. Here's the y-axis, etc. So uh, when I go over the unit disk, the region that I get is this uh, top. You know the the top part of this. Um, so it looks like uh, this cutoff top shell of my uh, paraboloid. So I've got this paraboloid and I'm just taking the cap on it uh, going above the xy plane uh, and I'm trying to compute the flux. And from eyeballing it I can see that at every point F is always pointing straight up. So in, even on the back here, it's pointing up, right? So uh, F is flowing up. So provided up is the orientation on my um, paraboloid, I expect my flux to be positive. We can check what the orientation on the paraboloid is because U is standing in for X, V is standing in for Y. So U cross V is... Uh, uh, pointing straight up. We can double check that. We actually have a formula for n. So n is 
uh, dp du uh, cross dp dv, uh, which means, and dp du is uh, 1, 0, minus 2 u, and uh, dp dv is 0, 1, minus 2 v. So when you take the cross product of these, you'll discover you should get a cross product for n that looks like uh, plus 2u plus 2v comma 1. Just to double check, I'm going to draw n in red at a couple points. So in case these parameterizations are unclear, this point out here, which is uh, 0 in the x, 0 in the z, 1 in the y, the way I would get it is by setting uh, in uv coordinates, this is the point 0 comma 1, because then uh, p of 0 comma 1 is 0, 1, and then 1 minus 0 minus 1, which is 0, which checks out. And so n at that place, n at 0 comma 1, becomes the vector um, uh, 0, 2, 1. Uh, so it's in 0 in the x direction. It's plus 2 in the y direction, plus 1 in the z direction. So it's going to go up something like that, which you can see is, in fact, perpendicular to uh, the parabola. Um, you can also check that this point here is the point u, v equals uh, 1, comma 0. And n of 1, comma 0 is 2, 0, 1, which points... Um, I don't know if I can draw this, but perpendicular off kind of in that direction. Uh, and at that point right there, that's the point uh, uv equals 0, 0. Uh, and n at 0, 0 is just the vector 0, 0, 1. Uh, so in fact, you can see that the orientation uh, on the paraboloid is up, in that the positive normal is the one pointing in the positive z direction, basically, rather than the normal direction that has a negative z component. So uh, I expect the flux to be positive. because my green vectors are agreeing with the red vectors, but they're not exactly parallel, and it's also not easy to compute the surface area of uh, this paraboloid, so I'm just going to compute the integral using our other, our parameterized form. So I've already computed what n looks like, right? So the double integral over r, uh, oh, I guess it's going to be over d of f, dot n d a, uh, which is the formula that we used, uh, we expressed previously in terms of dp du and dp dv. Um, I should write it maybe as n du dv. So I'm just using the fact that n is dp uh, du cross dp dv. Uh, this integral looks like the double integral over the unit disk, so still same disk, of um, uh, 2u, 2, oh, sorry, f, 0, 0, 1, dot 2u, 2v, 1, du, dv. And if I take the dot product of that, uh, the u's and the v's vanish, and I just get 1. So this is the double integral of 1, and I'm going to write it as dA over d, because, uh, in fact, the unit disk, I can just compute its area as pi r squared. So I get another flux of pi, uh, kind of magically? I don't know. Fortunately. But notice that we got this by computing the area of the unit disk d, not of the um, 
not of the surface as we did in the previous examples. Uh, but in the previous example, essentially the surface and its domain were the same. But here, uh, our domain is the unit circle below this surface. For example six, I'm going to change just one thing, and that's that I'm going to change h. I'm going to change my vector field from 0, 0, 001 to be 0, 0, z. So because of this, I actually already know that dp du cross dp dv from the last one is 2u 2v1. So let's just compute the flux directly, knowing that we've already fixed an orientation, the positive, the upward facing, positive z orientation on this paraboloid. P is for paraboloid, by the way. Um, so the flux we're going to be interested in is 0, 0, z dot 2u 2v 1 uh, dot du dv. And now you'll notice we have a problem here. This z is not in terms of u's and v's. So similar to the way we did parameterized, uh, we passed the parameters for curves before, when I'm actually writing, uh, in this case, h, what I mean is h of p uh, of u comma v uh, dot p uh, this thing we were calling n, uh, so dp, du cross dp, dv, du, dv. And so even when it's not specified, this is just often cumbersome to write down, but you should imagine when you're at a given u and v value, your z component is being determined by the parameterization. So I'm going to rewrite this entirely in u's and v's. Uh, this is the double integral over the unit disk of uh, 0, 0, 1 minus u squared minus v squared dot 2u, 2v, 1, du, dv. And now this dot product is definitely non-trivial. So I get 1 minus u squared minus v squared du, dv. Uh, and looking at this, I'm going to pass to polar coordinates for u and v. Um, so I'm going to go these two polar coordinates uh, just to simplify my life, because then u squared plus v squared is r squared. And so in polar coordinates, this is theta goes between 0 and 2 pi. r goes between 0 and 1, because I was on the unit disk, of 1 minus r squared. Uh, sorry, my parentheses, r dr t theta. And uh, now this integral is much, much easier to compute. So... Um, 0 to 2 pi, r goes from 0 to 1, this is r minus r cubed dr d theta. So when I integrate r, I've got constant bounds, I can do all of these at once. I'm going to get uh, theta evaluated from 0 to 2 pi times uh, r squared over 2 minus r to the fourth over 4 uh, with r evaluated from 0 to 1. And so my final answer is 2 pi times uh, 1 half minus a fourth, so that's 1 fourth. So 2 pi over 4 is pi over 2. And we're done. You might also notice that this is the uh, equal to the volume under... Um, the paraboloid uh, 1 minus x squared minus y squared above uh, the x, y plane. And you can kind of see that by looking back at uh, this form for the integral and realize that that's really just uh, a different description of what this integral computes. For our last problem, we're going to kind of combine all of our tools and we're going to 
take a sphere of radius 3, and suppose we have a radiation field, 0, 0, comma, 2z over 9. So uh, our warnings now are we have a complicated surface that we need to parameterize and a field that is changing. It's non-constant. And we want to compute the flux across the sphere. I just want to notice that, uh, maybe take a, take a moment to say these types of radiation fields, these come up in um, physics classes when you're talking about optics or luminance from light sources or spheres or, um, or like the sun's radiance and how much of it is hitting the earth. Uh, if you were trying to construct a giant solar sail to escape the uh, solar system, you would want to compute certain radiation fields and how much light was going to hit your solar sail at a certain radius out from the, the, the sun. Um, and these come up in like electromagnetism as well. So this, this type of integral is like really, really useful to understand how to compute. So what we'll do is we'll parameterize the sphere. So the sphere is just rho equals three, right? And so I'm going to parameterize it as phi comma theta, because we know that that agrees with the outward orientation on the sphere. Um, uh, and so this is going to, let's call, let's use, let's use P just for parameterized, is going to be, um, uh, and then using spherical coordinates, my x component is uh, cosine phi, sin, or cosine theta sine phi, my y component is uh, cosine, oops, sorry, three for rho, uh, three cosine theta sine phi, my y component is cosine, um, ooh, same as earlier, uh, is sine, the three sine theta, for like r sine theta, uh, and then times, um, cosine, oh, sorry, sine of phi, and my z component is rho, so that's 3, cosine of phi. So these are just spherical coordinates. And so now I'm going to compute, uh, and uh, my domain for this, let's call it d, is going to be um, phi goes between 0 and pi. And uh, uh, theta goes between um, 0 and 2 pi uh, in uh, the phi uh, theta plane. It's a little rectangular region. Um, so our integral becomes the double integral, so flux is the double integral over d of, uh, let's call this fields, uh, let's just not call it something, so 0, 0, and then 2 ninths times, well, z is uh, 3 cosine of phi. Uh, so that's my z component. Dot. Uh, and now we need to compute dp uh, d theta and dp d rho. So I'm just going to write that as dp d phi. Uh, sorry, phi not rho. Whew. dp d theta. Uh, d, and then that's d theta, or sorry, d phi d theta. That's my integrals. And so let's just also compute this. Uh, judging from last time, so uh, let's just call this n, n uh, looks like this, so it looks like uh, this cross product, ta-da, I computed some derivatives, uh, and then doing the similar sine squared plus cosine squared combinations from uh, before when I computed the cross product, you're going to get something like this, poof, this. 9 sine squared theta, or sine squared phi cos theta, 9 sine squared phi sine theta, 9 cos phi sine phi. 
Uh, and now we can take the stop product, but because two of these terms are zero, like these first two guys are gonna vanish in the dot product. So our integral becomes much simpler uh, kind of immediately. So my flux is the double integral over d of uh, two ninths uh, times three cosine theta, or sorry, three cosine phi times nine cosine phi sine phi. Uh, and all the other terms turn to zero. So uh, my nines cancel and I get oh, uh, d phi d theta. So this looks like uh, six times the double integral of uh, cosine phi squared, or cosine squared of phi, times sine of phi d phi d theta. Uh, and I'm integrating over d. At this point, you'd probably want to do a little um, u sub for u equals cosine. Uh, let's write this in a color. Um, so, so if I set u equal cosine phi, then du is minus sine phi d phi. Uh, and so this inner integral becomes um, minus u squared du. Uh, and so this is now a pretty easy um, integral to compute. Let's just scroll down a little bit more. So I'm going to get 6, uh, and now my integrals, uh, my thetas went between 0 and 2 pi, and uh, maybe I'm going to rewrite these ones here. So theta went between 0 and 2 pi, so phi went between 0 and pi. This meant that u was between uh, cosine of 0, which is 1, uh, let's actually just evaluate it and that'll be fine. Uh, this is now minus u squared integrates to be, uh, minus u cubed over three and u at when phi is zero, cosine is one. And when phi is pi, cosine is minus one. Uh, so that's my, that's my order for my bounds on u, uh, d theta. So uh, my final answer is that this looks like 6. Uh, the thetas give me, d theta gives me a theta, so I get 2 pi minus 0, and then times uh, u cubed, so 1 cubed, uh, minus 1 cubed is, um, yeah, so this becomes negative, negative 1 third, so positive a third, minus uh, positive, minus, minus a third. Uh, so that becomes two-thirds. So two-thirds times two times six, so the threes cancel, uh, and I get two times two times two, which is eight pi. Um, yeah, so that's the answer for how much flux there is across this sphere, positive eight pi. Uh, we could, it is maybe worth pointing out, where do I have some space? Uh, let's go up here. Um, it is maybe po worth pointing out that if we uh, draw a sketch of the sphere, right, then this vector field 2 ninths z um, at any point on the sphere that is uh, has the z component of the sphere. It's kind of like scaled by the z component. So uh, up here, uh, yeah, I don't know. The radiation field is uh, is up uh, at z equals zero. It's length zero, and down here, it's uh, when z is very when z is very negative. Um, then 2 ninths z is a negative number, and so it will be pointing down. Uh, so you can see that this vector field is kind of pointing 
out of the sphere uh, and it's pointing farther, it's like bigger as you get closer to the poles of the sphere. But um, it's not that the flow is going into the sphere below and out of the sphere above. So, um, yeah. So my expectation just from looking at a picture, kind of an estimate for what the radiation field is doing, is that my flux should be a positive number because I have uh, no flux at uh, the xy plane, but then above I have flux going out, going up, and below I also have flux going out, going down. So because I picked the positive orientation on the sphere, I have flux going out. So my total flux should be positive, which lets me check my answer. And we're done.